so I'm unsettled. I think I'm fine now and I'm, I'm on my phone. But thank you so much for having me and um, facilitate this program. It's, it's interesting, it's exciting, and on no other topic than after. And uh, I believe a lot of us know that Ghana is a host for the Secretariat of AFTA. And AFTA started um, operation, I think it, it took off on the 1st of January this year, I made COVID-19. But um, per re report that I'm reading, I think things are picking up um, in, in that regard in the market. And of course, Ghana is yet to implement its um, plan that's next month to facilitate um, the process to enable business um, in the SMEs um, space to take advantage of AFTA. I'm so glad that um, Prof is going to talk about AFTA um, this afternoon. Uh, Christine, I have something on my phone. I, I don't know what it is. Okay, it's a recording one. It says, are they okay? I've got it. Okay, so. I'm happy to have um, Prof. Charles Ajasi. Uh, we have not met, but I've engaged him when I, I was doing my dissertation. <laughs> I used this, some of his research. He did some research together with other co-authors on microinsurance in Ghana. And Prof, um, your research really helped me uh, in, in my dissertation because I was also um, researching in the area of insurance impact in Ghana. So thank you for that even though I missed you when I came to your office in essay. So ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you Professor Charles Ajasi. Um, he is a professor of development finance and an economic head of development finance from 2013 to 2017 with the University of Stellenbosch Business School. Um, he's also a visiting university um, lecturer for Groningen and a scholar of International Monetary Fund. Previously, he worked at the University of Ghana, Legon. He's a Ghanaian, of course. I, I'm proud to, to um, facilitate <laughs> his <laughs> webinar as a Ghanaian as well. <laughs> Prof. Charles holds a PhD from Stellenbosch University, an MPhil in economics, and BA in economics and political science from the University of Ghana. He is a consultant um, for World Bank, UNCTAD, Africa Union, Copenhagen Consensus, Frederick Stephen Foundation, Ghana, Trade Unions Congress of Ghana, Investment Climate Facility for Africa and African Development Bank. He serves on a panel of aspects of special commodities units of UNCTAD. And I believe he has a vast information and knowledge in AFTA as we, we go along. I believe we would all be witnesses to that and will be imparted. He facilitated for tariffs, trades, and regional integration within the West African Institute of Economic and Financial Management and is a network member of Africa Economic Research Consortium and Economics Through and Through, Nairobi, Kenya. Um, Global Trade Analysis Project, Purdue University West Lafayette in USA. He was a resource person on the AERC Collaborative Project on Financial Sector Development and Financial Inclusion in Africa within 2017-2019. His research focuses in general on um, area of development finance and development economics. Of course, he's married with two sons. He has published widely. I, did, I made mention of one or two that I use in my dissertation. So I cited his, his, his work is cited in my dissertation and I'm proud to say that contributed to chapters and has been a recipient of various research grants. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Prof. Charles Ajasi. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Geraldine, uh, Dr. Abedu, uh, for that uh, very kind uh, introduction. You 
Yeah, it, it, now I'm, I'm finding it difficult to talk because it doesn't sound like it. <laughs> <laughs> it <could be. laughs> um, and I'm very, also very happy to be a uh, part of this. Uh, well, I'm I'm I'm, I'm home uh, in the sense that at the, uh, home in at the USB as well. Even though yes, I know uh, that uh, all of you are joining from Ghana and other places, which is my other home too. But it's just also to say that I am uh, currently home, so I, I feel uh, quite comfortable in my two homes at the USB and in Ghana. So I will uh, go straight uh, ahead to share my screen and um, and tell you about um, the topic uh, as uh, Dr. Abedu, uh mentioned and what I'm going to speak about. So I will, the way I want to structure this uh, talk is uh, in um, three ways. Uh, the first is to just give a quick overview of, of the uh, AFTA or the African Continental Free Trade Area. And um, after that, I will also uh, then talk about the uh, reasons why this uh, was done. Um, and then the third, the reasons will, 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 will also uh, move into issues of questions which people ask, um, and lots of questions we that would have been asked about why um, after. Is it also just another one of the uh, uh, policy initiatives that, that are uh, you know, initiated and then um, without any, um, without having thought through them very well for the implications for Africa? And then the third angle would then be sort of linked to the second would be, well, if this is really good, are there any benefits? You know, are there any welfare you know, implications? And what would the welfare implications uh, look like uh, if they are there? And so those are the three uh, ways that I'm going to structure this. And um, I'm not sure how uh, we are going to uh, proceed, but uh, I'm happy to also take uh, any questions. Um, if you have them, if they're burning ones, I know that's a structure that will follow, but if you find that there's a burning question, uh, please uh, stop me. And, um, and I will try and also, um, uh, uh, make the, I would like very much for this to be very um, interactive. Okay, so I will go straight into what this um, is about. The uh, the first part of the of of the talk, which is a very short part, um, sort of like a historical um, overview of this. So I cut the history short, and I say I cut it short because uh, when you go into um, the history of the African Union. Um, the idea for setting up the African Union, one of the reasons for setting this up uh, was to have uh, a situation uh, or an African situation which would have one uh, common market uh, eventually, or one big market, uh, very well integrated and running smoothly um, across from east, west, south, and north. That was one of the major ideas. Um, this is 1963 or so. Uh, but nothing happened, and um, and then after that we had we've had a number of regional economic groupings. Uh, I uh, the um, an example would be the ECOWAS, you know, um, from West Africa, as we know. There's Waemu, which is the French zone. Uh, the SADC, there's Comesa. We have a lot of these um, regional economic groupings, and the idea behind these groupings were to try and again go to that integrated common market, uh, which we have seen. Uh, hasn't really happened uh, since then. So by January um, 2012, a lot of attempts have been, have been made to try and uh, make sure that the um, the after the 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 common market, as it was envisaged, would become um, a reality. And uh, a lot of work was made to put this uh, together to have a common uh, uh, market policy framework. Uh, 2012, um, the AU endorsed this. And it was part of an action plan, uh, which you know was to boost intra-African trade. And then, then the idea was that by 2063, uh, which is the agenda 2063 of the AU, um, the uh, African you know uh, continent will have that common um, market plus also a customs union, um, like the 
uh, EU. Okay, so now what exactly is this um, um, about? What was the what's the idea? The idea is just is you can put in a very simple form, simple form, uh, which is we should stop. Um, uh, when I say we, I mean uh, African countries should stop um, imposing tariffs on each other when we have to import or export uh, goods across. So if we have to um, move goods from, let's say, uh, South Africa to Ghana or Ghana to Nigeria um, or let's say to Kenya uh, of, or, or vice versa, uh, we have tariffs uh, that we charge, right? Uh, we have to remove those tariffs. So when we remove the tariffs, it makes it easier for us to trade. It makes it easier for businesses to move across and, and then also uh, increases um, the level of um, integration. Uh, we have tariffs as one, and we have another um, uh, uh, trade, what you call a trade barrier, which we also need to remove, which would be excessive customs, you know, uh, and procedures, uh, which always occur at our, our barriers, our, our um, uh, country barriers. So if we remove these, it, it will enable us eventually go to the single African market. It will increase the trade, you know, within Africa. It will deepen our integration. And there are very interesting benefits which we can get from here. Uh, there'll be increasing, you know, uh, improvement in technology. How does that occur? Once we remove the tariffs, businesses move across. There's learning across, um, you know, countries. Uh, one, the technology that, you know, exists in country A is also easily adaptable by country B, bearing in mind that we are common, we already, uh, you know, uh, um, we have common characteristics and it's e we're, e we're able to easily adapt each other's technology than one which is very much, um, let's say extra Africa or foreign outside of Africa. Uh, in addition, you know, the competitive edge that comes out of this uh, integration would also boost the technological, uh, the speed in te technological and, um, uh, adaptation. I mean, I can give you a classic example of the way um, uh, technology from, I mean, M-Pesa, uh, uh, which is uh, the um, the use of mobile, you know, phones to make payments. Yeah. Uh, the way that one, which occurred in Kenya, uh, immediately was easy to be, you know, adopted in other African countries. I mean, the, the success rates differ, yes, uh, but you could see that the adaptation increased uh, quite uh, rapidly. That is one of the you know things which can occur even much faster if we remove the tariffs, and there'll be these spillovers. Eventually, there'll be you know uh, regional, uh, widespread regional uh, socioeconomic development, and then welfare would also be enhanced. And the, the the benefits are quite enormous. Okay, so it's very appealing, and so um, by uh, uh, by by you know removing tariffs and all of these uh, barriers, we can enhance trade and then uh, get these uh, benefits. So that was the idea. And as we speak now, uh, as, uh, at least as of last month, um, 54, you know, uh, uh, country 54 out of, the, out of the 55 African countries have signed the general agreement and 40 have sort of finalized all the domestic requirements that are needed uh, to, get, to get their countries to, to the, rat the final stage is ratification. Uh, to get to the ratification state, and 37 uh, have ratified um, uh, after. So that's good to go, uh, which is why it's not surprising that January 2021, as Dr. Abedu said, um, after went live. And with the secretariat, um, which had been you know, um, um, uh, um, established in Ghana in August 2020, uh, last year. Um, and that's the, 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 the story so far. Um, but then the questions will be, well, uh, okay, so, but why, why do we have to go through uh, all of this? Didn't we, don't we know how to uh, uh, try to get to the common market already? Can't we uh, try and improve? Uh, isn't, aren't we trying to improve social economic development? What are the issues there? Well, I mean, why do we have to uh, uh, do this now? A couple of them that I'll uh, mention and then uh, go into one of them into a bit more detail, one of which we hardly talk about. So one is the normal thing we all know, we have weak productive capacities um, on the continent. Uh, economic diversification is quite uh, limited. So there's a lot of concentration 
uh, across countries, uh, right? So we know very well diversified. These are things we know. Um, we also have this high non-tariff uh, related cost. The non-tariff cost will be these, you know, um, excessive documentations and um, uh, questions that are asked before you can ship, you know, one uh, container from a country A in Africa to country B. Uh, incidentally, it's much easier, you know, to trade with countries outside Africa than to trade with countries within Africa. So we make trade very uh, difficult for ourselves. Um, one example I can give you is to go to any border, um, and not the harbor alone, but to go to a border um, on in, in you know a border town or bordering towns, and you would see long you know queues of trucks uh, waiting to clear documentation before they move from uh, country A to B. Some have to move to through two countries uh, to get to the third country, and there's excessive delay in all of this. We know these uh, problems. And uh, the other problems we also have, uh, we are very small, you know, tiny economies, our GDPs are quite small on our own. And so we are not able to also, um, uh, we can't uh, take advantage of each other's, uh, and since we are we are not together, right, we can't take advantage of each other's synergies. These ones we know. The other well-known fact, but which we hardly talk about, which is really a big issue, is the low level of intra-African trade. Um, so, the intra-African trade would be trading amongst uh, each other, you know, um, exporting goods from one country to uh, to the other. We export, you know, uh, we 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 are not very good in exporting outside uh, Africa as well, but within Africa we're quite low. And I'll show you a bit of statistics to make the point, uh, which is one of the uh, reasons why uh, Africa becomes uh, more interesting because uh, this is a free trade area. So the idea is. If we free up trade within um, ourselves, it will bring the economic and uh, benefits or the welfare benefits. And that's why the trade part is very important. So um, I uh, this is this uh, data from uh, UNCTAD, so uh, United Nations uh, Conference on Trade and Development, um, uh, UNCTAD statistics on uh, intra-regional trade. So I've taken this for a couple of regions and I just took the 2019 data. Uh, you know, specifically because 2020, you know, everybody was hit hard, hard with COVID and trade had dipped quite, you know, um, remarkably. So just took 2019 as something um, to show as, a, you know, maybe the, the, the most uh, recent aside COVID, the COVID shock. And then I'll go back and we see how things look like. So um, the, as of 2019, uh, we, I think this is probably about the best that we've done in intra-African trade, 17%. So 17% of trade amongst African countries, that's very low. I mean, we just slightly better than um, uh, Latin America and Caribbean, who also have uh, some of these uh, problems uh, that uh, we have, uh, compared to about well, 58% you know, in, in Asia. And the level of intra-regional trade is very important uh, for um, uh, re uh, regions, uh, economic developments, as we uh, uh, looked at before. So clearly, we we've not been doing well at all. I mean, this is the most recent. I'm showing you. If I go, if we go further back, uh, from 1995 until 2019, we see that not, not much has happened. You know, historically, uh, we we you know barely um, done uh, better than what we have now. So. For a long time, trade within Africa has been, I'm talking about formal trade, uh, within Africa has been very low. Compared, to, you know, compare that with the um, other um, regions and you see massive uh, intra-regional trade. Of course, I mean, if you look at the economic development uh, indicators or the, the, the level of development of these economies, it's also not surprising. Uh, so that's one uh, reason. I'll give you another, um, of our challenges, which will be the last, and then a switch to um, what kind of um, benefits, further benefits uh, that this could bring. So one of our other challenges is these uh, multiple regional groupings we have in Africa, and they are overlapping, you know, um, structure, and the difficulty in also uh, trying to uh, have a common market if you have these kinds of uh, uh, regions. Um, so we have. 
lots of these regions uh, from CEMAC, you know, Central African Union, there's a, a, a SENSAD, which is a community of Sahel, but you find some CEMAC members in there. And there's COMESA, which is a big group. Um, there's East African community, which, you know, also in, uh, has uh, um, uh, COMESA, you know, in there. There's the uh, ECAS, ECOAS, uh, uh, IGAD, and, and, and so forth. Now, all of these groups just create a lot of, you know, um, administrative challenges. Of course, there's overlapping membership. So if you have to um, think around, you know, trade uh, within Africa, these also make it uh, very difficult. But having said that, uh, one of the groups, the, the regional group is, which seem, seems to have done so well, or seems to be leading the pack in terms of the inter-regional um, trade in Africa would be the East African community and then followed by uh, SADC. So East African community uh, would be doing something like 20% also uh, of intra-regional uh, um, trade in, in Africa um, and then followed by, by SADC. But overall, you know, very low um, levels of um, within, uh, uh, even within the subgroups itself, um, the level of trade is, is is still quite low. So that would be uh, that would be enough, you know, justification for us to rethink uh, the, the you know what we have as regional. Is it um, giving us the best, or are there benefits that we can get from this? Try to um, take advantage of you know um, some uh, policy uh, or some strategies, some trade strategies, and that's where. Uh, after comes in. So what kind of benefits can we get from after? Well, a, a lot had been said. Um, it's going to increase the scale of production and investments. Like I said before, once we open up, um, then industries or businesses can move, you know, uh, freely across uh, 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 the continent. And one of the significant benefits that this can bring is what we currently um, have not particularly I understood very well with Africa direct investment. Uh, so this would be um, like foreign direct investment by Africans, right? So this would be uh, Africans investing in other African countries. And the reason they can do so is because now, you know, there are no uh, boundaries to trade. And that's also very, very important because, um, you know, the, the what we already see <clears throat> in Africa now with, um, Financial services, telecoms, um, uh, in terms, you know, we're moving across from East Africa, uh, uh, West Africa, Southern Africa. Um, that alone is showing a signs of massive, you know, pro uh, possibilities of massive investments across by, Af you know, uh, of African origin, and these investments are more likely to stay, you know, than to go out, uh, and and that's very very important for a region. Um, and then uh, it's going to also increase the level of um, uh, intra uh, uh, African uh, intra industry competitiveness, competitiveness in Africa. Um, another advantage that this would bring is the ability of small and medium enterprises to take you know advantage of bigger markets. So most of Africa's um, economic you know firm tissue is about eighty percent SMEs. Uh, right. In fact, if we if we go further down, there's a micro uh, segment as also micro, small, and medium enterprises would make something like 90, 90 uh, uh, plus percent uh, of the the firm activity. Now, this is usually just stuck in one country, um, but opening up, you know, the um, countries across would allow these enterprises to take advantage of what exists in other countries and also to tap into the regional. Uh, chains in there. Uh, even more importantly, there will be lessons uh, learned across in terms of value addition. Um, we wouldn't have to import. So some of the, the things we do now, which uh, that which is quite you know strange, is we import we we export raw materials uh, to places uh, for it to be uh, processed, and yet we've got countries in Africa which can process it. And after processing, we re, we, we re it back at higher prices, but we can process within Africa. 
And now where the processing is also done in Africa, uh, the, some of the material is not bought raw from Africa, it's bought, you know, semi-processed from elsewhere. We've got a very weird, you know, structure which uh, it's going on with, but which small enterprises can tap into, um, and, and, and as well as the uh, big enterprises. All of these will increase domestic production um, in each economy. And then also we have this, um, uh, not just the vertical sort of uh, the, depth, the, 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 the depth of the economy, but expressed across regions, right? So we'll be having these uh, horizontal investments uh, across because we can move from one country uh, to the other. Essentially that should increase uh, welfare and um, all economies uh, should uh, then uh, benefit. So that's the idea. <clears throat> As I will, will benefit uh, from uh, after. But now there are lots of you know, questions, right? Uh, some of which I've put here. Um, so these questions were there before uh, the people are still, are still raising them. And now, because not much is known. I mean, when we talk, about after you know, the question is up. So is this just you know, in, re removing tariffs? Well, if we remove tariffs, then are we not going to um, end up you know, um, destroying markets? The existing markets are going to be destroyed. We remove tariffs and then what happens? Uh, governments will not get revenue from the tariffs anymore. Is that not going to worsen uh, welfare of households? You know, are, are people not going to become uh, poorer? Because these tariffs, you know, um, can you know governments make money from? Uh, how is, is this going to stimulate growth? Would this ever you know happen? How is it going to enhance uh, investments? Uh, and how exports going to grow? Uh, will industries benefit at all? You know how will cross border investments increase? Uh, these are genuine questions which will be asked uh, by people, um, and unless we're able to show that indeed this is possible, uh, one can get uh, benefits or we're able to do analysis to show uh, whether um, AFTA can indeed bring these uh, benefits or not. So what I will, um, the, uh, the, the, and now I move into this, the third part of the, of, of the, of the talk. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you about now is uh, how one can the good, uh, the, the try and estimate these uh, benefits, which is good in the sense that uh, we can, given the current situation that we have, uh, we can assume, you know, uh, a situation of January uh, 2021, where after it's in full force and tariffs have been removed. And then we try and see how the economies will respond, uh, right? Uh, how will the uh, um, uh, investments look like? How will um, GDP, will it grow or will it uh, shrink? Will exports grow or will they shrink? And we have... Um, a way that we can assess that, and uh, and that is what I try to uh, uh, do here, um, which is uh, based on uh, which is so now this is done based on the whole economy, for um, not for 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 a country and then for the region, and we do this for the whole of Africa based on the data that we have for um, twenty two African countries. Um, um, so to, to data for the entire you know economy uh, of those countries, and we do this uh, using what is what we typically call the an applied general equilibrium analysis or computerized general equilibrium analysis. The idea is to take the whole economy um, as it is, um, map it straight with um, another economy within you know, the after in this case region, and then start removing the tariffs that are there. So the data already has tariffs. So we remove the tariffs, and then we try and re-estimate how the economies will look like when we remove the tariffs, because that's what after is, is about. Once we've done that, we trace the effects from uh, GDP to a household, to investments, to savings, to um, um, exports, you know, imports, any part of the economy, uh, which sectors will, will, are going to benefit? Um, is agriculture really going to benefit? You know, is there going to be, you know, manufacturing um, in, industry increasing? Uh, we try to do this, and um, so what I'll present to you is, is, is what we did, and I'm saying we um, did with two other colleagues, um, Imotep um, uh, Alakidede. Um, uh, 
Michael Imhotep Alagidede is um, his is at Vitz University, and uh, Michael Graham at uh, USB uh, Stellenbosch, and then um, uh, John Smetsa was also at Vitz. So we did this um, work, and it was part of some work that we had to also do. So this is a paper we did, but part of a bigger. Uh, project for Afrexim Bank, which is the trade finance um, bank uh, in in Africa. Okay, so uh, I won't bore you with all the exciting things that we tried to do in the paper. I'll just go straight to some of what we found. Very interesting I find. It's really interesting. And uh, I've also skipped some work that others have done in the area. And, and just to show you what uh, uh, we've done recently. So using this... Um, uh, data and the model and, and we, we, you know, got, this is a lot of, um, it's about 140 sectors, you know, reducing 50, so 57 sectors per each country, each country, sort of 140 sectors, um, reducing 57 sectors. And then we do this for uh, try and analyze to see the effects uh, of removing tariffs. Very interesting. First, you know, uh, snap, uh, first uh, sort of a, uh, a uh, snapshot of the overall effects that we see. Uh, if we remove tariffs, there are going to be long-term benefits, welfare benefits of 17, you know, uh, 0.9 billion US dollars. That's mag you know, th these are huge uh, amounts to 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 uh, to get. This is on the continent, you know, wide basis, right? And um, it will mean we have a sustained um, GDP growth across. So this is the average, you know, um, growth in GDP across of 3%, uh, uh, which is quite significant. Uh, household welfare, you know, or per capita uh, income in households, again, across um, uh, it's, it's, uh, an average of uh, 1.9, almost 2% increase. Um, the, in terms of exports, we're going to be having um, an annual increase in exports uh, of about 5.2%. Two three percent uh, imports about uh, six percent. So these are you know erupt increases which will be occurring on annual basis. Um, in, terms of, in terms of trade is going to be improving. So we're going to be exporting um, a lot. There will be a lot of you know uh, exporting. Of course, we import as well, but we won't be in a, an adverse situation where we 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 uh, uh, we struggle with our uh, terms of trade. So that's uh, overall uh, to give a snap. Uh, short. If we zoom into exports, so what we do is to zoom into exports and try and see um, what will be occurring uh, if after becomes comes into full force and um, uh, um, as uh, we did with this uh, analysis. So uh, this is how I want you to read this table. So this is um, direction of trade. So this is uh, take all North Africa uh, trades with itself. So this will be North Africa trading with North. So if like Egypt, um, Libya, Morocco, um, um, Algeria, you know, trading with themselves, uh, this will be the amount of um, trade, you know, extra uh, exports that will be generated, that, that will be trade, that will be occurring amongst themselves, uh, 4.4 billion. So these are extra, you know, amounts of exports which will be occurring. And North Africa will also, um, be able to trade a 2.6 billion, uh, you know, to, to, to generate 2.6 billion uh, amount of exports to West Africa, and it continues like that. And in total, across the continent, um, the uh, amount of you know exports that North Africa would be able to, you know, cumulatively um, move into a, a sort of a, a, a direct into the continent will be 10.4 billion. Um, and virtually, I mean, all the, the, the regions here would have significant, you know, increases in uh, exports. Um, and the, so across the regions and the totals um, also circled here. Now, here we find within, very interestingly, within the, the, the continent, so we have SACU, which is the South African Customs Union, uh, which is already sort of a customs union, it's a much stronger union. Um, in there, um, so the, the the countries there, of course, get a lot more. Not surprisingly, because they already have uh, uh, reduced. Uh, there's no, you know, reduced uh, sort of common tariffs or reduced tariffs uh, amongst uh, uh, them. It's a it's a union already, so it's a, it gains probably more. 
uh, from from there. So 18.4 billion within that's the first that you know in terms of the, the biggest benefit. Um, doesn't mean others don't benefit, um, but that's the biggest benefit. Uh, and then followed by the West African region, which is also driven more by the YMO, the French uh, zone, the CFA uh, zone, which is also already a union, which is quite strong, just like SACU. Um, actually, in a way, much stronger. Uh, 12.9 billion, and then North Africa, um, also 10 billion. Others, other regions are also equally uh, making lots of, you know, um, uh, having lots of benefits from growth in, in exports. So massive growth in, uh, in trade amongst regions uh, once it's okay. So we've seen that it's a total welfare, you know, benefit, uh, 17 plus billion, all right? And then um, some of it comes from GDP growth, you know, per capita um, in increase, household, you know, per capita increase. So households will be having uh, those uh, increases and exports within ourselves also grow uh, this much. Now, if we try to um, take the welfare side and then split it up again further and ask ourselves, okay, so what will really be driving uh, the welfare? And this is very important. Um, uh, it's driven, so we find that it's driven by, of course, I mean, the idea here is that there should be, uh, the, the, the economy should be able to allocate um, these, you know, um, gains, you know, in a very efficient way. And um, so the distribution of the gains must be done, you know, uh, uh, in a very uh, efficient uh, way. And that's the allocative, you know, efficiency side. And we must be able to see the, um, some um, level of, you know, um, gains or benefits when we look at it from that side. There's also the technological improvements which will occur. Uh, there's the terms of trade I talked about earlier on. And then there we should be able to see, uh, you know, a lot of investments and savings, uh, which would then amount to the total welfare of uh, uh, 17.9 billion that I talked about. So we see these uh, gains, um, and it's it's you know very. I mean, what this is telling us is that when we remove these tariffs, we become more efficient in the way we allocate resources across, right? And and we gain, you know, you know, something like 2.9 billion. Uh, the, the total wealth, welfare that we, we get from 17.95, something like 2.95 billion is just because of you know, efficiency in allocating resources across. Uh, 8.6 billion comes from technological changes, which will care, uh, in terms of trade, you know, 5.9, and then the cross-border investments uh, that will care, and the savings that countries can make, the total is 459 million, um, which, is you know a lot more than the amount of FDI even from outside that we get um, for for some countries. So very interesting, uh, significant uh, uh, benefits. Now, um, if we zoom a little bit, so and this is the the the, the, the nice thing about the kind of analysis that, that we do with this, we can go into the all the final details. And if we zoom further down, um, so yeah, I try as much as possible to um, put in some of the um, sectors, um, I'll, I'll just read, tell you the most important thing. So we're looking at, you know, um, sec sectors across um, grains, meats, you know, livestock, uh, fish, fishery, extraction, all the way to uh, other services, financial and insurance, and so forth. So we're looking at the, the, um, the, the amount of, you know, where the exports will be coming from within ourselves, right? Um, and uh, so anything above this will be positive. Anything below this will mean that it, there'll be a drop in, in, in exporting, um, you know, amongst ourselves. And the gains that, went, so there's largely a lot of gains across. I mean, we, which is why we're having so much, you know, welfare. Uh, but the largest would typically come from the textiles and apparel, um, light manufacturing, you know, uh, and it's uh, quite uh, clear here. Interestingly, what we find really interesting for us is that um, the extraction industry, you know, we reduce, um, you know, the, the the level of sort of um, we we'll reduce in terms of the uh, exports and um, and the metals um, as well. Extraction, which is something which we always um, have uh, environmental issues with anyway. So massive against, um, you know, across. So in the end, we ask ourselves the question. So is this, you know, after really welfare enhanced? Well, it is. Um, We've seen the massive welfare benefits. Uh, we've seen where they will come from. 
Um, we've seen that it's to be increased, you know, um, uh, savings, investment, uh, firms, households, you know, benefits. They suddenly will be short-term adjustments. Um, so we have to, you know, countries have to adjust for the import tariff revenue, which will freeze short-term, and then the, the changes which will happen in, in sectors. Um, but then they are compensated with, you know, uh, the fact that now you, you become integrated into um, a regional uh, value chain, which means that we need to build capacity on this, and which is why it's very important to um, uh, know a lot more about AFTA, uh, build capacity, you know, think around how to, you know, deal with the, 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 the short-term uh, shocks, uh, regional infrastructure institutions, which is why the building of the Secretariat and the work that the African Bank, you know, African Development Bank um, are doing, so that the African Union it's very, very important. Um, regional bureaus, um, regional trade fa facilitation centers, and all the adjustments that uh, policy designers need to okay um, to allow uh, this to take off. Otherwise, we don't make the uh, 17 billion that I just talked about. So that ends um, the, the the talk on AFTA. And, um, and thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to lots of questions and um, uh, comments. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Ajasi. Um, there are a few questions in the chat box, and I would encourage um, those who have questions to post them in the um, chat box as we discuss. But I have a few. Um, and of course, um, as you elaborated, AFTA is supposed to bring value addition. You know, most African countries, we, we export raw material and then import the finished goods uh, when um, value is added to these. Um, it's good that it's going to help in, in adding value to our raw materials so that we get more out of what we export, especially in the area of agriculture. But my question is, yes, um, there's welfare impacts of AFTA on the continent, um, and especially those who are going to have a workable strategy to engage in, in AFTA market. But I want to bring it home. Poverty alleviation, and then the gap, I mean, poverty gap, it keeps widening. And most of um, the economy uh, of Africa runs on agriculture. The smallholder farmers contribute close to 70% of our Greek produce, but they are marginalized. They, I'm, I'm wondering what the impact of this um, after will be on these smallholder farmers who grow our cocoa, who grow our foodstuffs, um, that we go and export to other countries. That's one question that I have. The next one has to do with security um, in terms of the borders. Now the borders are going to be opened, so to speak. So there'll be free movement of goods and people to other countries. How secure are borders um, in terms of those um, SMEs or traders would want to take advantage of um, the benefits of AFTA. And the last question has to do with the impact of China. We import almost everything from China. Now AFTA is coming, it's giving opportunities for companies and SMEs to also sell their goods on the, on the um, common market or the continental market. How is China going to impact vis-a-vis um, -vis the benefits that we are supposed to derive from AFTA? Hello. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you very thank much. Thank you so I much. I just realized my, my mic was mute. I was speaking, but I, I was Oh, mute. I see. I said, okay. um, um, thank you so much um, for your presentation. Um, a few points, value addition to our produce. Um, that's what yes. AFTA is going to bring. Of course, in Africa, most of our produce are raw materials that we export. And then we in turn import finished goods um, that we need. So it's, it's good that AFTA is going to bring more focus on us adding value to our products. And then of course the direct um, investments that you can go into any Africa country to invest, I think is a good thing. But I have about three questions to ask. The first one has to do with um, the impact of China on AFTA because everywhere we go to China to import 
most African countries even have China malls. You go to the malls, everything China is in there and they are cheaper. So how would that impact um, the, the benefits or the welfare impact of AFTA on the continent? The second one has to do with security. Now our borders are going to be free. Of course, customs, there's a customs union that's going to help in reducing or taking off tariffs. But then we have to move through these borders and we've had challenges with security. So how is AFTA going to help or support regarding securities um, on our borders when we travel to and fro and countries to engage in um, the continental market? And then my last question has to do with um, how, and we know um, um, per information that I read, the EU has, I mean, promised about 74 billion um, euros to support after SMEs. How are those um, smallholder farmers who constitute about 70% of the um, agri-based um, support for the economy, how are they going to benefit? Um, I'm wondering, um, those in the villages in, in Northern Ghana who grow the cocos, they grow the, the food crops and all that, who are fairly uneducated, how would after impact them to, to help bridge the, the poverty um, gap and alleviate um, poverty in, in our um, African countries? Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Dr. Abedu, for those very interesting questions. I've also seen the, like you said, questions in the chat box. So let me uh, try and attempt. I won't say that I'm answering the questions, <laughs> uh, but I will uh, attempt based on what, you know, uh, this, what AFTA can do, and then uh, uh, show the, the potential in, in dealing with some of these. Um, so let's see, uh, let me take it from the, uh, uh, maybe security well security on the in the borders okay so yeah, yeah. so um the first one of the things that we ought to, to 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 do which is very important is to have these um a coordinated efforts at dealing with uh, security that's one crucial uh, thing that we we need to uh, have in place what is in, what is nice to know is that we already have the uh, uh at the au we already have the regional security collaborative efforts which are coordinated at the AU and which can then be used to uh, try and uh, deal with the securities and, and this will be initially to be the 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 immediate shock of uh, you can cross the border with no no real checks to put it that way and so it, you know almost anybody can go through so initially we have to then deal with the regional coordination of the securities at the borders, which already is in place. That's the, 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 the nice thing about this is that a lot of the things have, have been in place uh, from, let's say, a regional economic grouping point of view and at the AU point of view. What we need to do now as respective countries is to agree that there will be a common uh, way to deal with, you know, um, trade or movement of, you know, uh, goods and services across borders in terms of the security side. So we have them within countries, Right within uh, regions at the AU, but we've, we've not really taken the effort to um, to do the cross-border uh, work unless there's there's a, um, a, a conflict problem somewhere. And usually that's when you see that we have this regional security, uh, you know, uh, group. So we we nice thing is we have them, uh, but we need to you know um, start working on how to deploy them. Eventually, we'll get to a point where it won't be the borders are not borders anymore, like the like you know. Uh, mm -hmm. like in Asia or in Europe, where now the security will become less, sort of, it will just be the, uh, you know, security, which is like a, the normal security that we have to see. But initially, yes, we need to make sure that um, that is controlled. And, and that won't be extra expense, like I'm saying, because that is um, already there. Imports from China, um, are very interesting. This is so uh, I, I tried to tie that in with a, a bit of the EU, you know, the EU promise. Uh, mm -hmm. So you would see that immediately um, the rest of the world has seen that this is really serious business now from Africa, uh, right? Um, it is, you know, the, the continent is, 
is trying or has made a bold statement and is working at it to make sure that uh, it's going to increase, deepen its trade within itself. For that reason, any country or group that we trade with from outside would want to be a part of the benefit. But you have to do it in a way, uh, there's a, uh, one section of this which I haven't gotten into, which is rules of origin. Uh, you have to do it in a way such that you do not bring in, you're not going to bring in products, sem, you know, semi-finished for it to be passed on to another country to be mm -hmm. uh, imported. It won't be allowed. So you have to now be a part of the, the, uh, the economic activity that generates, you know, the, the products or the services for them to be exported across. So in a way for China, well, it is like competition. Okay, if you want to trade with us, then you better invest in Africa, not you know, just uh, send uh, finished stuff because we can produce them as well now. Uh, it's the same for, for Europe. So EU is, is, is also, you know, uh, coming with the idea, well, I'm going to invest in a particular sector, uh, SMEs, because I see that that is a big, you know, um, uh, sector um, to invest in. Mind you, our respective governments are also going to be uh, en enhancing the, the SME sector, you know, um, give you one example uh, on a project which is already uh, underway by a Fregzen Bank, uh, something called Mansa. So Mansa is a portal uh, which uh, countries have signed up to and which would uh, register any small um, medium enterprise in Africa, um, give it rating and say, oh, inspect you know, what you do and then uh, give it a rating and say, okay, uh, we approve as a trade a trade finance bank that you are you know formally registered you uh, good uh, company so we can match you with a big company in another African country. In fact, as I speak in November, uh, the same bank is organizing the Inter African Trade Fair uh, in Durban. It's the second or the third of its kind, and all of these things are linked in a way to try and pull all potential big and small players together, you know, such that. Uh, they can take advantage of uh, moving I mean, uh, business across borders. And then for the small farmer, the first advantage that the small farmer gets is that suddenly um, I've got lots of buyers for my produce, mm. you know, mm. because initially your buyers are limited to your country. And then you there's usually maybe a bit of a cartel also around that. But now you have a lot of buyers because a lot more, you know, companies can sell across. And uh, that's why. And then suddenly you also know about the value chain. Uh, you know a lot more about you know processing uh, for instance cocoa you know that it does a lot more than just the bean and so you want to also tap into part of the uh, the value chain so it opens up you know a lot of opportunities of course it's not uh, one shot it doesn't happen uh, overnight but it's gradually just opens up for uh, uh, farmers uh, as well and um, um, I, I want to see if I'm, I'm addressing um, the questions you raised all of it i probably if i have missed one yes you have <laughs> yes you have but um i think our time is up there's one question oh. i want all and um, two that i'm putting together for you to answer then we will be done um, and okay. the first one is um currency where ah. we have multiplicity and and secondary poor infrastructure which can inhibit trade and then the next one is what's the process um, that if you want to participate in after um, as a small or medium scale organization, um, what are the processes that you need to go through to be a party to this? Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, right. So on the currency and point infrastructure, uh, well, two good, good questions as well, in addition to what you uh, raised earlier. Poor infrastructure, yeah, that is our biggest challenge. And um, so that's why I, I ended by saying we, we need to now invest a lot in our regional infrastructure. You would see that African Development Bank uh, also a couple of years ago came started this uh, Africa Infrastructure Index. The whole idea is to try and track you know, the um, infrastructure across, look at the amount of investment that is needed and try and invest in these um, in, in the infrastructure and on that i know that the uh, of course under au um, are working to try and improve on the uh, especially the road uh, uh, first with road and then ict and then some of the services um, within the continent that's our biggest challenge 
um, which needs to be worked on. Uh, currency is also being worked on now. Um, there is uh, um, this, this, uh, the, uh, product called PAPS, uh, Pan-African Payment Platform System, which has just been started by Afrexim Bank. The idea is to have one single convertibility of currency. So it's not having one currency, but to say, if you're going to send something from, let's say, uh, Ghana to Kenya, you don't have to start thinking about converting from, you know, CDs to, um, uh, um, what's it called again? Um, the Kenyan shilling. Uh, yes, or shillings to, uh, 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 it, what happens is that once you trade under PAPS, which will be under, under this. So it goes to the central banks. You don't do anything. Um, the central bank, you don't pay for these, you know, uh, convertibility issues. Uh, you don't have to be thinking exchange rate issues. The central banks will know the rates and it's an agreed uh, rate across central banks. And so that removes all the currency problems. Uh, that's, uh, kind, you know, it's currently underway and and and, and it's, it's already live, I should say. So with the, uh, after would also uh, go live uh, in there. Um, and then the process to participate, uh, that is also one big um, challenge. So just like infrastructure, you know, where to go as an SME, it's normally the, the kind of question that people would ask. Uh, the immediate thing that should happen is that uh, the revenue, the, uh, uh, the revenue, you know, um, services or the investment promotion agency uh, within a specific country uh, is the first point of goal of, of call that one will need to all this is the business um uh, the association of business um you know uh, in in their respective country they would have to know about after they would then be, be able to tell whether the country is ratified or not and what you can do and where you can you know uh, 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 where what kind of line of business you can get into so that should be the first point of call it is slow, I must say, because uh, it just started. So, um, but um, that is the, uh, the 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 first uh, point of, of call. I know we're out of time, so I don't want to take up all of the time. I, but I also know that I, I really enjoy the questions, and I want more. And I I I I, I am looking at uh, Dr. Bedou and hoping that she can ask me more questions. <laughs> Oh, we are, we are fine. I think um, we have another session, so we didn't want to take more of your time. Um, I believe the slides will be shared um, so we can, um, and if it's you, you're kind enough to maybe send us your email address, so if we have questions, we can I mean, send you mails where we can continue with the engagement. But thank you so much, Prof. Charles Ajasi, for this insight. I, I had a uh, previous, I mean, presentation. Somebody did it for on after, and I, I tell you, I wasn't, I wasn't sure what I was listening to. But you have brought a bit of um, understanding to the topic. Thank you so much um, for for this um, insightful um, presentation. And um, we're moving on to the next. Ah, thank, you. Thank, thank you. you. thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Crystal. Thank you. I do not want to take any more time and we'll hand over to um, Samantha Bobo Passat for taking us through further. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> Thank you, Crystal, for the introduction. And um, it's my great honor and pleasure to welcome um, all participants this evening in our information session. Uh, a big thank you to Crystal for handling the slideshow for me and to Lizelle who's busy admitting people still into um, the Zoom room we're using. Um, I would like to, um, I'm going to be very brief because we're starting a few minutes late, um, but we Sorry. are delighted that you are considering the University of Stellenbosch Business School 
as the school where you wish to pursue your studies. Um, we have two amazing presenters this evening, um, and I'll introduce them in a little while. But first, a few housekeeping rules. Um, we would like you to please make use of the chat box and to post your questions there. We will be monitoring them and, and, and making sure that we answer them during the course of the evening. Uh, we ask you to mute your microphone while we're busy with the presentations. Um, when you ask a question, if we say you go for it, please, you're live, just introduce yourself and, um, and, and, and ask your question. And, you know, if you're not shy, camera shy, then do switch on your camera so we can see you. Um, in terms of the program this evening, um, we this is a very brief welcome, house rules, um, and then introduction to our speakers. Um, before we hand over to uh, Dr. Jakub Fulskink and to Professor Ewan Thimister. And then uh, we will have, uh, once they've given their overview, there will be time for a discussion uh, before we close the event. We are very much aware of your time and that you might have time constraints. So just before we do the introductions, a quick um, bit of marketing. Uh, we will be having our USB virtual open days. For those of you who wish to join us between the 4th and the 11th of October, you will see we have different time slots assigned on different days for the various programs. So do take a look and see which program you're most interested in um, and find a time slot and sign up and join us for those virtual open days. Um, then um, I think very important for us is for you to know that if you choose the University of Stellenbosch Business School as your um, educational partner, that it is a journey on which you will be joined not only by um, your faculty member or your study leader, you are joining a community. And that community comprises of professional support staff. And there's some of their pictures there. Those are some of the people who will guide you through the journey. And they're extremely important because you will have most of your contact with them before you actually arrive on our campus or join us virtually. Um, you will deal with colleagues in the applications and admissions office. You will deal with colleagues in the Center for Student Administration. Um, you will deal with the International Affairs Office. Once you're here, you deal with the career leadership colleagues and don't forget our IT colleagues and our um, learning support colleagues. They will guide you through the journey. And once you end the journey, um, it doesn't really end because then we hand you over to Christelle and Lizelle for your alumni um, journey with us. Now, apart from the professional support staff you will work with, we also have an amazing group of faculty members. And there's a few pictures and um, representing the full-time faculty at USB. Um, they're an amazing group of people. And tonight, as I indicated, you will meet two colleagues, um, Dr. Jakub Falskink and then Professor Ewan Thimister. Um, but, oh, Crystal, I almost forgot this information, which is very important. If you have any inquiries, please reach out to us. We have with us this evening, Mariki van der Merwe, who is responsible for um, representing USB in Mauritius, West and East Africa. Um, and her email address is listed there. And then we also have um, at USB, Henry Boysen and uh, Charmaine Garcia, and their email address is listed there. And they will respond to any inquiries you may have. 
Now, I was given the task of introducing first Dr. Jakub Falsking, but you know, it's everything is up there on the screen, and he's a very impressive academic and researcher. He's also the head of the <laughs> MBA at USB. I know that picture makes him look very scary, but I, I can guarantee that he is a very kind man, that he uh, cares greatly about his students, um, about his subject matter, and he uh, is um, really engaging, and it is an absolute pleasure working with Yaku. Now, Dr. Uh, Professor Ewan Fimister, I have not known as long as I know Yaku. He too has a very impressive CV, but I've actually never met Ewan personally. He joined us in 2021 uh, during lockdown. I have engaged with Ewan um, virtually, and all I can say is he has a tremendous, tremendous sense of humor. Uh, there's always a joke there. Um, and he is the only Scotsman I know who is freezing in the South African winter uh, because unlike Scotland, our homes do not have central heating. Now, Christelle, I am going to stop there and hand over to Yaku first. Uh, welcome to both Yaku and Ewan and over to you to do the presentation on the USB programs. Thank you so much, Samantha. Um, that was a, a great introduction. Those of you on the call, you might not have noticed, but there was a bit of an inside joke there because um, Ewan had much more on his slide than I did, but he is a much, much more impressive academic than I am. Um, I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm going to launch a, a poll to just determine um, who's in the room and why you're in the room. So in front of you, you should see a poll that says USB program information session. What, is, what USB program are you interested in? And you can please just uh, indicate on there which ones you are interested in because that will guide our conversation a little bit later on. And while you guys are doing that, I can maybe ask Ewan as an introduction. Ewan, you, you, you joined the business school as a as a as a new recruit, uh, well, a, a very experienced but new recruit, what attracted you to USB? Uh, well, um, thank you, Yako, for, for, for that introduction. As you say, you managed to get the fact isn't that I'm quite elderly and um, <laughs> new at the same time. Thank you. Um, yeah, so it's it's actually who I came and visited, and it's, it's, it's what Samantha was talking about, is the community, the sense of community. And I'll give a really big shout out for the support staff and the, the sort of the welcoming. I remember I was actually in South Africa just before the first lockdown. And I, as a newly arrived um, uh, foreigner, I was, I was asked to go for a, a, a COVID test. And it was some, one of the, the members of the support staff took me and, and helped me do that. So it, it is that, that sense of um, togetherness, I think, is the, one of the key things that, that got yes. me going. Thanks, Ewan. Um, all right, I, I see while we were talking away, about eight of the 20 participants uh, completed the poll. So let me stop the curl poll in five seconds and then we can proceed. Um, I will do a general introduction and I will ask you to comment once in a while. Um, and then we will go into specific programs a little bit later on. So let me just uh, share the, the poll results with you so that you can have an idea of um, of exactly who is interested in what. So there's quite a big component of people on tonight's call that is interested in the PhD in business management and administration. So again, I would like to uh, remind you that there will be more information sessions in the week of the 4th of October with a lot more information than what we will do tonight. Tonight's more a general introduction to the USB, uh, to what we stand for, et cetera. I'm glad to see that there's quite a few people interested in the MBA or PG DIP in uh, business management and administration, and then quite a few in development finance. Now, um, Ewan, just remind me, I just want to make sure there's not going to be a PhD in development finance in 2022. Is that right? That's, that's great. Unfortunately, um, actually, as a, as a reflection of our success in recruiting, uh, we, we haven't got any more capacity and we want to keep the 
support our support yeah. for the students. Uh, so we're not it's yeah. not going to be a recruit, recruitment drive next uh, next for next year. Coming All year. right, thank you. So that that is indeed that there are two people that indicated that they would be interested in that. Uh, so just so that they're aware of that. Um, there are a few people interested in development finance. Uh, there's one person in future studies, coaching, leadership, project management, financial planning. So there's quite a, a big, big um, scope. We're not going to go into too much detail into any of these. Again, the week of the 4th of October uh, is the, the week to look out for. So let me uh, get on with the presentation. Let me just share my screen. I'm going to just move that over to the side. So if you're not familiar with the USB, this is the, the building. We are halfway between Cape Town and the Winelands, uh, but we've also got, we're in a region very close to what's known as Durbanville or the northern suburbs of Cape Town. And five minutes away from there, you can be on a wine farm, um, very pleasant environment. And like I said, you can have all the action of the mid-city mid life, or you can go to Salambash and experience the, the mountainous area of the Western Cape uh, to full effect. Um, let me just quickly move my chat so I can see if there are any uh, questions. So in terms of the vision and mission, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I think what is quite important to us is the fact that we're very strong vision and mission driven school. So we want to make a difference in the world. You can see our vision is to be globally recognized as a source of value for a better world. And the mission makes reference to our teaching, uh, to our research, but as well as the social impact of the school. And one of the biggest ways in which we make a social impact is actually through our students. I don't want to um, go through all the values, commitments, statements by themselves, but I do want to uh, point out the, the second one, equity. Uh, if you know Stellenbosch and the history of Stellenbosch, you would know that we've got a, 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 a dark history that we would like to acknowledge and we are make it very explicit that we would like to work towards restitution in South Africa and to play our part in achieving that. Now, there are roughly... Uh, this is kind of what, what marketing uh, put together for the reasons to study at USB. Uh, I think there are ne a number of, of good reasons to study here. Um, so let me, maybe I'll do the first five and then I'll give over to you and to cover the, the second five. Um, the first point, just I will show you the portfolio of programs that USB has, and it is really possible to study with USB your whole life and not be bored at any point because there are so many programs that you can choose from. Also, the accreditation of this school is very important to us. In fact, there's a fourth accreditation, the Association of African Business Schools that we're working towards, but it's a new accreditation agency focused on Africa, and we're actually one of the founding members. So, so there are no accredited schools at the moment, uh, but we're working towards that. Uh, we're a school that, are, that is very strongly associated with responsible leadership, and you will see that in all our programs that we speak about that and also the nature of the programs. Uh, I think one of the things which in the COVID area, era has become much more important is the aspect of bl blended learning. And no, regardless of which of the programs you'd study, you would probably at some point be um, exposed to the, this blended way of working. And I'll, I'll elaborate on that a little bit later on. And then again, also gaining a global perspective is quite important to us. We're very proud of being an African school, but when we speak at international conferences, we represent Africa. We speak about the research that we do in Africa, and that research is relevant to the rest of the world. Uh, Ewan, do you want to cover these five? Well, I'm, I might start, and then I'll let you come back and, and finish and sort of right. round off the things I've, 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 I've missed. Um, so clearly, uh, as uh, Jaco said, um, we're a, a school with a, a enormous expertise. We, uh, our faculty, a, a, a relatively small permanent faculty, but are uh, very research active and across whole areas, all the, the broad areas of, of business school, development, finance, um, uh, general management, strategy, um, the coaching, uh, uh, leadership, etc. The, one of the things, and, I, and I, I really would emphasize this, that you get from uh, Come to USB is that uh, networking. 
So you've got collaborations with, with uh, your peers and the, uh, in many of the peers are, are, are really are, uh, quite advanced in their careers. They've got a lot of experience. They bring a lot to the classroom. Right, so there's a collaboration within that. So it's not just about us as uh, as faculty telling you what's uh, uh, what, what's what, as it were. Uh, and then, of course, um, number eight uh, benefits of the school business connections. Well, as, as part of, of that, and we've just had an event with a Prof uh, Ajasi. You know, there's that alumni network, uh, which is part of that uh, global connection. But there's also connections through our uh, as the faculties connections elsewhere in the world. Um, I mean, I'm from elsewhere, as it were. Uh, so, and that's part of that. Um, and then I think I'll pass back to you, Yako. I think it was done to to go to finish off in nine and ten. Um, uh, Thanks, you. Some example of that. If I if I can um, restate number eight, I think the alumni network, and this is also what Crystal Kron here would tell you, we've got the strongest uh, alumni network in Africa, uh, with more and more online MBAs we find that students, even though there's more digital availability, people crave that connection and they wanna to speak to people, they wanna connect with people. So what we've started to do at the business school is also to have, uh, at the moment it's once a semester, but have dinners at different restaurants. Uh, we've had it in Namibia, we have it right through South Africa, depending on the number of alumni in a certain city, we, we would have one, for instance, in Accra, if there are enough students. And I'm pretty sure there are uh, enough students in, in Accra at the moment. Um, but I think what's really important for us and development finance came from there was the relevance of the degrees that we have. When you study a degree in management, you wanna know that it's curated content. It's the stuff that you need to know to be the best manager that you can be. And then, the last point, I mentioned this before, but the very strong focus on social impact for the school of wanting to make a difference. Right, so I, I spoke about this lifelong learning idea and here in front of you, you can see the different streams and historically the school has always been very, very strong in business management, development finance and future studies. That's what we're, what we're known for. Um, of course, within business management, very, very strong in terms of leadership, which is why you would see some project or some coaching and leadership development uh, along with the M full in coaching as well as the PGD or the postgraduate diploma uh, in leadership. But you can start with a PG dip, a BMA, do the MBA, go on to the PhD, or you can move horizontally as well. You can start with a PG dip and BMA and then move across to the M full in development finance or even Infill and future studies. So there's a lot of flexibility. If something interests you, you can always tweak your, your learning pathway to suit your own needs. Now, I think I made reference to blended learning. There are two ways that you can study degrees with us. And particularly if you look at the table at, on the right, the programs that offer the modular programs is the MBA or are the MBA and the PGWMA as well as the MPhil in development finance. But those you can also do in the blended format. Now, just very briefly, the difference is modular comes to campus every few months, like two and a half months apart, and you would be on campus from the Monday till the Saturday. It's very intensive. You can, you can think about it as a sprint. In that week, it's all the content and it's, it feels like a rush and you can only focus on, on that. And that suits people that want to have that face-to-face -face, uh, experience, but have the time to take that away from, from, uh, from their work. Uh, we often see with overseas students from Europe that this is very popular because they want to come to South Africa, they want to be here for a week and they take an extra amount of leave uh, and, and that works really well for them. On the other hand, the blended students, uh, most of their studies is during the, the year on a Tuesday or Wednesday evening, you will have two sessions of class, so four hours of lectures during a week, and it allows you to catch up with the material and to kind of absorb it in a much slower way, almost more like a marathon, uh, if I can use the, the two anal analogies to contrast this. The one thing I do want to mention is that there's a slightly lower opportunity cost with blended, which means that you don't have to fly to South Africa every time that you have to attend class. So you don't pay for accommodation and you don't pay for, for those flights. But 
what is important with blended is at the beginning of the blended program, you do need to come to campus. So once a year during your two year MBA, you will be required to come to campus. Uh, and potentially, if there are electives on campus, as well as if the international study module, uh, if, is, if that's in South Africa, then you will have to come to, to South Africa as well. So a long explanation, please ask if you don't understand, but we will cover this again in the week of 4, 4th of October. We're quite excited uh, this year or next year to launch the new PG DIP format. So there are four PG DIPs at the USB, the PG DIP BMA, Development Finance, Future Studies and Project Management. So what makes it so unique is the fact that we actually put all the students of all these PG DIPs uh, programs for the first module, we put all of them in the same classroom. So your network is just so much bigger than what it would, would be on if you particularly just did just the PG dip in leadership, for instance. So you get much more uh, diversity in the classroom, uh, et cetera. And what's also really important is for those of you interested in the PG dip BMA, um, that some of the modules on the PG dip BMA actually gets repeated in the MBA as well. So the MBA costs you less if you did your PG dip with us, and you also have a little bit more free time in that in the first six months. If I but it's not going to be a lot of more free time, but it does give you a little bit more breathing room than all the other um, students. All right, so. The PG dip is around flexibility. So you've got flexibility, whether you want to do your PG dip in one year or in two years, you've got the format flexibility, whether you want to come to campus or whether you want to do it in a blended format. Um, I should also mention that even if you did the, the blended programs, which is once a week to have classes, if you are close to campus, you can still actually come to campus and have those sessions on campus with another with other students that also want to be on campus. So there's still that ability to have a, a, a group of friends doing an MBA together and meeting them uh, regularly. Also program flexibility. You could start off with a PG dip in one area in your first year and then actually switch specialization in your second year. And then also um, you can do standalone short courses on any of these PG dips. Now, I said that you can do your PG dip in either one or two years. What that means is that you can do these modules. So understanding the world is the one where everyone's in the same uh, room. In term two, responsible leadership, the same there. And then you can see in term three and four of the first year, you get split depending on which of the PG dips you do. But what you could also do is in term one, you can combine understanding the world with any of these modules. So business finance, if you are in the BMA stream or financing for development, if you are in the development finance stream. So you can see how you can actually uh, kind of squash the two years into one. Uh, it is a little bit of a heavier load, but a lot of our students do that and it's regularly done. So don't think that it's undoable. So do consider that because it does shorten your studies by a year. Um, for those of you that are not in South Africa, I guess it doesn't matter even if you are in South Africa, but you have to be aware that you require some bandwidth in order to attend the classes. So if you do one-on-one -on -one calls, so if you just have a meeting with a supervisor, for instance, it will take about 540 megawatts, uh, megabytes. Uh, and if you attend class with your video off, which is not our preferred mode, uh, you can see with and without video how much bandwidth or how much data that would take from you. So that is something you need to consider. There is a cost involved and it's in terms of data that you will have to buy. Uh, someone says blended studies. You mentioned that you will be required to come to campus sometime during the program. Uh, will it be for a week as well? Yes, in fact, for the blended MBA program, it's 10 days at the beginning of your of your MBA or nine days, I think, and, uh, for, for the first week until Saturday, six days, and then until the Wednesday or the Thursday, I'm not entirely sure right now. Um, maybe Henry or, one, or someone can comment for us. By the way, Henry is on the line as well, I think. Uh, so he, if you have questions, he can also some, answer some of those for you in the chat. The international students, here's some information. So you met um, Samantha Volberg-Passard earlier. 
Um, she's from the international office. Be aware that at the moment we've got national curfew uh, throughout the country uh, from 10 in the evening until 4 the next morning. Uh, you should be off the streets, you should be home, etc. And you must be COVID negative when you come to us and all of those normal things. I don't want to spend too much time on this. Then uh, I will just quickly repeat uh, Mariki Fanamava of Global Natives. She's our uh, African representative in terms of enrollments. So please contact her if you uh, are interested in one of our programs and she would be able to assist you. And then again, I'll just, uh, uh, sorry, there's a name on here, which actually is a name that I was in a presentation earlier. Um, but I must also say that these staff and our own faculty are very important to us. Um, one of the reasons why we want to show our faculty is not many schools in South Africa or even Africa, if you go to the website, will show you their faculty because um, a, a full-time faculty is quite an expensive thing to manage, but it gives you a tremendous capacity for research and for having experts in the fields. And, um, one of the metrics that I'm very fond of is citations per capita or how many times you get cited by other researchers. And if you take researchers at, at Stellenbosch, at the University of Stellenbosch and the, the business school particularly as well, we've got the highest citations per head of any business school in Africa. So there aren't any other schools that you will see uh, with the strength in the faculty that we have, but people with tremendous industry experience as well. And um, it's something that we're very proud of and something that we would like to, to show you. All right. So we were thinking about having uh, breakaway rooms. And I think there's quite a number of people that want uh, different programs. Uh, can I maybe ask Ilza, what's your feeling? Do you think we should quickly speak about the different programs or should we rather um, split development finance into one room and I can do the rest in another room? Um, yeah, Yaku, I think maybe we can just quickly speak about all the programs um, together right. and then not okay. go into breakaway rooms. All right, let's do that. I will talk about the MBA and BMA very briefly. So Tasneem Mutala is the head of our PGT BMA. It's one of those ones that can be done in conjunction with the others. So um, it's, it's aimed at a slightly younger profile, but also people that do not have the qualification to go in the MBA just yet. So it's a, a preparation for the MBA, and therefore there's overlap between the two uh, in the form of organizational behavior, accounting. Um, there's, oh goodness, oh, my mind suddenly lets go of me. I think stats is one as well. There's a few of them that actually overlap. Uh, you can do one or two years. It's in either blended or modular. Strong focus on essential management skills and entrepreneurship, and it allows you into the MBA. So if your marks are high enough on the PG DIP, you are automatically enrolled into the MBA. If your marks are not high enough, then you have to go through the normal selection process for the MBA, just as, a, as some background. So what are the competencies that we cover in the MBA BM or the, the PGD BMA? We said essential management skills, entrepreneurial, responsible leadership, uh, the context of uh, the business environment is very important to us, but also then that uh, African contextualization is important. Uh, you have to have a bachelor's degree in order to get into the PGT BMA, or you can also get in via recognition of prior learning, but please speak to marketing about that if you are interested. And there, I'm just going to not go through all the other requirements. It is here in the well, slide. The recording, the, the recording will be available a little bit um, after tonight's session as well. All right, that's a picture of me. And um, as uh, Samantha said earlier, I'm not normally this series. This picture was actually taken. Uh, um, there will be I can please make sure that you are muted. If you uh, have questions, there will be some opportunity to ask questions just now. Um, I'm not normally this serious, but this picture was taken for a talk about climate change. So that's not a funny matter. So it is a little bit more serious than usual. Okay, I'm not gonna say too much about the MBA still. It's a very much accredited, a very strong focus on responsible leadership. We've got the international study module that requires you to visit a country abroad. In the time of COVID, we've had virtual programs, which 
worked great because we were able to still visit companies like uh, Ferrari and um, McKinsey, et cetera, at the international office, but, but in a virtual uh, context. Uh, even though we have a very strong focus on responsible leadership, our MBA is one of the most quantitative MBAs in, uh, I would say, in Africa at least. Um, and we're also very well known for the strategic management aspect uh, of the MBA. There are four streams, the generalist stream, the MIO, which is aimed at the development industry, so United Nations, uh, World Health Organization. There's the stream focused on healthcare leadership, which is very attractive. We've had students from across the world doing this one so far. And then from next year on, we've got an MBA specialization in project management, which is also in, in, endorsed by the Project Management Institute of South Africa. So it's recognized and it's the only program um, in the world that is that is recognized by the PMI in South Africa. I don't want to talk about that again. I have already. Uh, let me go move on. Uh, the PhD BMA. This is Lara Skelly. She's the, the, the head. Very strong focused on, on uh, leadership. Uh, we are accredited with Edamba. We are part of the GRLI, uh, which is about responsible leadership. Um, and I would say that our PhD program is very well supported. So you've got a series of colloquia and through that you get interaction and feedback from other faculty along with just offering you um, soft deadlines so that it actually helps you to keep to the schedule. Um, the admission requirements for this is just purely uh, based on the fact that you have to have a master's and you would have had to pass that master's quite well. And uh, we, we only allow a certain number of PhDs in a year, so the, the, the quality of the application is very important to us. Um, Ewan, let me give over to you. I'll, I'll drive if you want. Well, thank you very much. I'll just uh, I'll indicate when you want to change. So thank you. Um, and uh, let me just spend a, a, a couple of minutes just talking about development finance in general. I wanted to, to talk, uh, do that, and then we'll, we'll go quickly through the, the two programs that we're going to talk about. I'm very sorry that Prof uh, Azek Pono, who's uh, pictured here, can't be here with you tonight. He's unfortunately been taken ill, but um, uh, so he is the head of the group and, uh, and leads a, a group of, of about eight to 10, I think, of academics. One point, just picking up on what Yako said about the permanent faculty, very important, I think, uh, in two ways for you. One is that it means that you're, uh, the, the teaching that you get is, is research-led. It's, it's linked to research. You saw that with uh, Professor Ajasi, uh, um, you know, presentation. The research is, is going on on the African uh, continent of free area, and that comes into the classroom. The second is about that breadth of knowledge and if supporting you on your research projects. So I think that that's uh, also uh, important, that uh, we have a breadth of research experience and therefore we can guide you. Um, so I want to talk first bit, uh, briefly about development finance, what it is, because it's very broad and it, it's, it's sometimes difficult to pin down. It, it covers economics, finance, governance, leadership. For me, it's about the question of how you mobilize resources to achieve economic development in, in Africa, um, both at the small level, the enterprise level, uh, access to finance, allowing uh, uh, people to, uh, to develop um, themselves and their businesses, or, et cetera, but that's also at a large level in, in infrastructure. Um, so, uh, and climate change, as uh, Yako has also mentioned, is a, is a big area, area he, here. Um, and so it's about trying to understand both the big picture, the big challenges, and how one deals with that at the, at the micro level. And I think that's one of the, in terms of what's unique, because they're now so the program at USB was one of the, the, the first programs, if not the first program in development finance in Africa. There are now a number of programs. So what's different about us? Well, we're, we're focused on that. Uh, we have more of the, the big picture uh, compared to other programs. We also are focused on that on micro level and, and, and small business level is, is something that's coming through. Um, uh, so... If we just talk through, if you could just move on to the next slide, I'll see uh, if it's not too, too much of a surprise for me. Uh, so this uh, is a, an example of some of the things, so the, 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 what we're trying to achieve um, of understanding how we, of the challenges of uh, um, unlocking the growth potential. Um, 
of uh, being able to evaluate and uh, uh, recognize what uh, uh, the, the, the types of solutions are to those types of problems. Uh, so it's about evaluation, it's, a, it's about, it's about um, um, defining the development needs, uh, the financing gaps, it's about evaluating them. It's, so it's a, it's a combination of, of knowledge uh, uh, and uh, skills, and, and, but also being able to use those skills to, uh, to, solve, to solve problems. And just as in the others, because the PG DIP as Jaco said, has this uh, modular uh, structure. So it's very similar to that. It has all those elements. Um, and we have a lot of, uh, of, of uh, graduates who, are, who have worked in the financial industry. And similarly, it's, it's also about, it's just about both, both the programs are about, uh, are designed for uh, developing your skills and your knowledge of development finance. It's just about the stage you're at, which is the most appropriate. Yeah, so whether you're earlier on in your career or later on, and depending on your background. Uh, okay, I think um, that's what I don't, I think I've really covered quite a lot of that in terms of uh, what we want to, to say. And the, 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 as I say, the MPhil is just, it's at, at, at a high, slightly higher level. There's, there's a, a greater research component. So the, the, the students are busy doing now their, their research, their research um, projects in the second year. And these are significant pieces of work. They are, um, and, uh, and across a, a whole broad range of, of areas. So um, that's, if, if you like, the, uh, apart from the deepening of the knowledge that you get uh, relative to the PG dip, what's what you're getting on the MPhil. And of course, it allows you to uh, carry on if, or potentially at least, um, to, to, a, to a higher level. But I think that's all I want to say. I'm happy to talk, ask, answer questions. I mean, we're, as I say, I think what I want to, to, to get across is that if you like, what we're trying to do in terms of what our uniqueness is, is it's about um, the enterprise focus. We've got a, a technology focus very much embedded in the, pro in the programs that we're trying to develop for practicality, trying to uh, get it to be, uh, to also to give you skills which are, applicable when you get back into your uh, into your work context and whilst keeping relevant. Okay. Thank you, Ewan. That was great. Um, there were two questions in the chat section that I just saw now. The one was asking, um, will everyone be required to come to campus if you do blended? Yes, you are required to come to campus once a year at least. So at the beginning of your program for the MBA, for instance, and with the development finance, you will come to campus because you need to meet your cohort. We want everyone to meet each other. You get put into your teams uh, so that you're going to be working with that team for the rest of your MBA, or at least for the first year of your MBA. I'm not sure if that's the case as well with development finance. Um, but in your second year, you will also come back for the first week of the year or of the academic year to again meet with your cohort and then we do certain of the modules and actually that's the elective week normally, so you do specializations during that week, um, but with the MBA, you will have two more opportunities to be in a group physically, the one is for the international study module and the other is for the elective week that you are required to come to South Africa. Then uh, Brom E asked about, is the option of a blended MBA available to South African citizens or only to international? No, absolutely, it's, it's available to everyone. And in fact, now during the COVID period, even the modular programs um, ran with a blended format. So we had blocks for a week, but the students that were scared of COVID or uh, lived with their parents or any other reason that they may have, uh, they had the choice to also be able to dial in. Of course, it's not a, an ideal situation to sit at home and watch eight hours of class and now and again participate. So that's not the ideal, but it is what was required due to the limitations that COVID put us under. So, so absolutely blended is available to any student that would like to study at Stellenbosch. The PG the Future Studies, the, the Future Studies program, uh, Professor Andre Ru is a very well-known academic in South Africa and in the future space, uh, was one of the first futures programs in the world, in fact, and one of the best known in the world. Uh, they uh, often consult to companies about what to expect and how to kind of design the future that you want and how to execute as well. So it's, it's very much 
a lot of MBA students uh, and other degrees as well. But when people finish the MBA, they said, oh, I would like to do another degree. Um, and then future studies is often that because it is very much about very high level thinking once you have all the technical skills in place. Uh, unless you are, of course, a futurist, then the, the, the future studies is the ideal program for you. The, so you can see here some of the uh, key competencies that you will see. Uh, the, uh, the idea of being able to work with complexity is becoming increasingly more important. The MPhil in future studies is just the master's equivalent of that. And you can see uh, it's also like uh, Ewan said on there's a stronger research component to this very, very highly acclaimed program. Um, I would strongly suggest people look at that. Um, and you can see here uh, again, complexity, uh, long-term decision-making, et cetera, and becoming a, a professional futurist. The uh, PhD in futures, very similar. I'm not gonna talk about that too much. And then there's the MPhil in management coaching, coaching, which is headed up by Dr. Nikita Blanche. Again, one of the first, I think it's one of the only programs in South Africa in coaching, uh, a, a professional coaching qualification. And by the end of it, you actually have your own coaching um, methods that you kind of design during your studies. Uh, I, saw, I see there's a question, Ewan, that you can have a look at in the, in the chat. Um, one, when I'm done with the coaching part, I will give a view to answer that. Um, right, so it's just an overview of management coaching, uh, multiculturalism, talent development, different styles of coaching. You know, I uh, different people are very different. So you develop a style of coaching that's unique to you. And that's a very, very strong outcome of this degree is that your coaching uh, practice becomes very authentic and focused on your own style. Okay, uh, right. Before I go on with uh, PGD leadership, Ewan, do you want to respond to the question? Yeah, I'll try. Thank you. So the, the question, for, uh, uh, and I apologize if you get um, a mango in your, in your not moniker as well, Keneally Watsiki, uh, is um, about whether you, uh, you need how much your first degree needs to be relevant. I will pass partly, I think I would have to pass this to Samantha to talk about uh, the exact requirements for from the USB's perspective. My, from my experience with the USB, but also elsewhere, is these are, this type of uh, degree is uh, about trying to draw in and uh, be as, as inclusive as possible because uh, many people like, you, like yourself, you've got a lot of experience and that can be brought to bear. And, and it doesn't mean that you won't necessarily struggle with certain parts of the, the program, but you have a lot to offer it for, for the whole program as a, as a whole. Uh, and that you know that experience is relevant. So it, 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 I can't give a definitive answer given that, this, that, that level of information, but I, th I think my, my um, uh, encouragement would be to, to, to ask and, and, and apply also. Uh, and uh, because it's it isn't a, you know you need to have a certain background the the the, the, the lots and lots of people on the for on the on the current uh, MPhil for example come from a whole range of backgrounds you know uh, from sort of straight economics all the way through to law but also uh, you know political science all that sort of thing so it is a big variety yeah. Okay. Thanks, Ewan. Right. I think and what's quite important. Yeah, sorry, so, sorry to talk about Jacko. Just to point out that Samantha's uh, reply to that also. That's very, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank um, you. Be aware that you would need a uh, the correct NQF level program to be let into the higher one. I, we did mention recognition of prior learning earlier. I would say, you know, if if you want to go for the masters, try that and see if your application goes anywhere. What happens usually is if they do not admit you into the masters, they would automatically ask you, can we pass you on for the PGD um, marketing team? Uh, we can only do 10% of our students on recognition of, recognition of prior learning. So please try and get your application in as, as soon as possible. Otherwise, you might just miss the, the cutoff of the number of students we can take. And of course, that 10% that 
increases as the year proceeds as more people uh, with the right qualifications uh, into into the program but i think if you are in a microfinance environment uh, chances are that you might be able to to get into the masters directly but then if you also don't have the pgd just yet um, I, I think that's very thin at the moment but you know that's not my program and it also depends on your experience and what role you currently fulfill. Um, the half-life of knowledge is about two years, so it doesn't really matter anymore what people had for their undergrad. Uh, but for the development finance, it's quite a very it's 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 a rigorous program. And if you're not familiar with finance, I would I would be scared of going in there uh, without the the right tools. Um, good evening. What is the right minimum working years required for application to the MBA. I think uh, Henry can possibly assist there or one of the marketing people. I think it is uh, three years is the minimum number of years that you would need experience, but we also look at what kind of experience that would be. Um, all right. Uh, yes. Okay. No, 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 that's, that's great. It's three years and you need to have experience on an executive or senior management level. Thanks, Henry. Um, absolutely. If you if you're unsure, you know, try try sending your application in and and see where it goes. I think uh, it's worth the shot. Um, I think if we look at a portfolio of characteristics in your application, so sometimes even if someone has three years, but it's not necessarily at the C-suite level, we would still consider it if it is a strong profile and someone has something to contribute to the classroom discussions. So the PGD leadership is um, also a very popular program with us. It, 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 it was one of our biggest PGDs at some point. Uh, it's still one of our bigger programs. So it's headed up by uh, Dr. Natasha Winter Titus, a very highly acclaimed, uh, I think she's an industrial psychologist. In fact, she's the chair of the South African uh, organization for, for uh, industrial psychologists. So it's all around the me, we work and world model of leading in those different spaces. You can see that it's very much focused on reflection as well, understanding yourself, um, but also making strategy uh, applicable to people and make it more human. So it is in the shift uh, from manager to leader. Uh, I can, you can see on the slide, there's a number of things. Uh, these are the things that we try to develop during the, that PGD program. Um, and then there's also the PG dip in leadership with specialization for nonprofit organizations. I don't recall anyone saying that they're doing this, but this is edited up by, by Dr. Armand Bum. Also, it, it, it arose, as with many of our programs, because of a demand that we had. We had a nonprofit organization training course, and then people said, but what can I now do that would still focus on nonprofits? So it's one of the only ones in Africa and very popular program um, as such. Okay, and then there's also the PGD in project management headed up by, uh, by MC Butter. And MC is very well known in project management circles, very experienced project manager. And he's the one that also facilitated the agreement with the PMI, the Project Management Institute. So we're very proud of this program and it's been running for a number of years. Uh, again, very highly acclaimed. And it's part of this suite of uh, PGD programs. And then last but not least, the PGD dip in financial planning, uh, which is one of the qualifications that you require for the um, certified financial planner uh, qualification. Uh, it, it is a slightly younger profile usually of people that do this. Uh, also one of the most popular programs in South Africa. And I think for a number of years, we had the highest pass rate for the uh, exam for the qualification in South Africa. So very, very good program. Uh, one of the programs with the highest numbers currently uh, at the USB. All right, and I think that brings us to the end of the presentation. Uh, good gosh, uh, time flew so it's three minutes before the official end but i'm more than happy to stay on if there are particular questions if you have a question please post in the in the chat or unmute yourself if you would like to ask a question anyone
Ewan, did you learn anything tonight that you didn't know about USB? Uh, I'm sure a lot. I'll have to reflect on it for, for a while <laughs> and think about it and come back to you. Uh, I know I did learn. I was very worried that you told me that um, knowledge has only got half life of two years <laughs> um, because I think that means I've forgotten everything I've ever learned. But um, yes, so uh, I guess I would have to. I'll have to think about that. <laughs> um, yeah. What about you, Yako? Well, I th let me let me maybe qualify the the, the two year half life. It's for unused knowledge that you would after two years you've lost half of it, and by so you know as such after four years you only have a quarter left. And I know from uh, having friends in Europe that if you apply for a position in in the Netherlands, they actually just say to you you have to have a B degree or a master's degree. They don't actually tell you which master's or which degree because they realize that actually. You can learn the things you need to know very quickly if you're at the right level. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, I don't so see any there, other any questions. questions. Are there questions or um, anybody like to, to say anything or make any comment actually about um, what, uh, what's brought you to, 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 to think about USB, for example? I would love to know in the chat maybe uh, which countries mm -hmm. the delegates are from, the people that are in the room tonight. What yeah. what countries do you represent? That would be very interesting if you can just chat in the chat, say which which country you're from. I know that Mariki is from Mauritius. We're all very jealous of her. I keep on asking her if if we can deliver one of the modules on the MBA in Mauritius, but she keeps denying my my access. Oh, this Michaela in Cape Town. The new what's the key? Oh, based in Nigeria now. Okay, so good good African experience. We love that on our programs. Like I said, we're very proud. We've we've got on the Masters in Development uh, in the in the MBA. We've got a program a module called Perspectives of African Frontiers. One of the very popular modules uh, because it is very 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 Af Afro optimistic and it sees Africa as one of the biggest growth points and a very positive view of Africa. Diago. Yes, Henry. Right. So. Somebody on the that's in the in this meeting, she's yeah. got a BSc in diet dietetics. Yes, honors. Yes, she's very interested in the MBA. But now you know it's not a business honors degree. Any thoughts on that? Um, just a BSc in dietetics. Um, my wife did a BSc in food science. And she did an MBA in 2016. Uh, in, in fact, it's inside information, but that's how, that's how we met. <laughs> um, but I mean, she thoroughly enjoyed the MBA and afterwards for a short while went back to corporate. But today she's got her own consulting company and she's busy with a PhD. So um, very much, you know, don't be scared. There are plenty of people. And I think with a BSc behind you, um, you will enjoy modules like statistics and contemporary decision-making uh, those things that are a bit more uh, scientific in nature, but there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to comfortably go through the MBA. Thanks, Henry. That's a good question. Uh, Yaku, maybe I can ask a question from my side as well. Um, yes, you've said a lot about, you know, all the programs and everything, but over and above the teaching hours and the hours that you would be on campus, Mm -hmm. What else would be expected of you in terms of, of you know, work and, and hours that you need to put in over and above that what you attend, that, that you have to attend in class? Look, I, I think with the masters, the, the rule of thumb is usually an hour to two hours per day. And, and that's maintaining your performance. That's not increasing your performance. And this is also with the with the level of your qualification, uh, it, it would be different. So someone with very little business experience with no finance experience will have to do a lot, work a lot harder for the financial modules, for instance, than someone that maybe has a BCom degree and has already served on 
a financial committee has done budgets, etc. So it's it's a hard question, but I would say, as with anything in life, uh, you know, the lawyer the the lawyers in the classroom they do well in certain modules because they're very comfortable with certain content. So there will always be a part of the MBA that you may enjoy more than than others. Uh, to my surprise, a lot of people that usually say they're not good at stats end up really enjoying the stats. So don't don't think that you will only be interested in the things that that's why you do an MBA because it it gives you a much broader base of skills and something else. Um, one of the things that we do on the uh, different programs in 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 at the USB is we don't write tests or exams on campus if there is a test or an exam which very seldom happens it's only for modules like stats where you can't actually give someone an assignment really but if you do write a test we use a proctoring software program that allows us to to see your screen as well as your face and record sound so that we can uh, be assured that it's you writing the exam which gives credibility to your degree um, and it's 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 very very handy um, and it works really, really well for us to be able to do that audit trail of knowing that it is actually uh, the students that say that they're writing the exam, that's writing the exam. Uh, Kanil was asking, can you take a break from any of the programs and resume at a later time? Yes, you can, uh, but there's a restriction on that. And also, if there's a redesign that happens and the modules change name or content, then you'll unfortunately sometimes not get recognition for those. But again, there's an expiry according to South African law. I think we can only recognize modules for maximum of, maybe Henry can help us here. I think maximum of five years is what we can recognize. And after that, it falls away. Um, but if the program had changed, then you can think with a program like the MBA that needs to stay current, we're constantly redesigning, bringing in new content in, throwing out other content. So at the moment, FinTech is proper popular and FinTech is in the MBA program. In 10 years from now, it might be something else that has replaced FinTech for that matter. I hope that answers the question. Um, should there be work pressures during the study period? Uh, I think that's such a tough question. I had an interview with Financial Mail uh, yesterday and I was asked this exact question. I think at the moment with COVID, people are working really hard. It's really difficult to balance studies and life and work. Uh, but a lot of our students thrive under these circumstances. So again, it's very personal. It's possible to do an MBA. There's plenty of students that are succeeding and thriving uh, during the MBA. So uh, it's if, if you set your mind to it, you can do it. That's what I what I strongly believe. Can I add to that? Yeah, yeah. Yes, please. Uh, so I, I would say uh, what I would uh, just um, recognize that the, the USB and Stellenbosch is flexible. So when things come up, they do respond. It's not like it's uh, uh, so rigid. And there are, yes. of course, particularly in this context, uh, you know, in the current world, things have uh, lots of things have been coming up. And so there is yeah. flexibility uh, uh, around yeah. that. And I think the other thing to say is, I'm very aware of this, and I know my colleagues are too, that, you know, that our students are, you know, going the extra mile or kilometer, um, mm -hmm. depending on your taste, uh, at the moment. And we, the, fa the faculty's job is to try and support that as much as it can. Yeah, so that we are there to, and particularly when they're doing the research project, to give them support through that process, which is, which is for, for them is challenging. But then, and that comes back to your earlier question about you know, who should apply, is you, you want to do something that's challenging. But the people who, who uh, I would feel that, you know, if you, you, you know, if you've got the prior background in, in developed finance and everything is easy for you, then I, I'm, there's part of me, and I'm just I'm a, maybe a yeah, very old-fashioned you. It's that then you're not we're we're not doing quite a good job. But also, it's, so the people who have who come and they have perhaps a slightly different background tend to get most out of the program. They have mm -hmm. to they have in certain elements they have to work hard, hard at, but they get a lot out of it because of that. So yeah. um, I think that's the I would also say that. Absolutely, and I, and I think something which I, I in in preparation for that interview that I had. 
I asked some of my class leaders, you know, because they sent me some of the questions beforehand. And one of the strongest messages that I got back from our class leaders, and I get it constantly from students, is the support that you have from other students, which is why it's so important for us that you meet your cohort at the beginning of the year. Because when the tough, when the tough gets tougher, um, you want to reach out to other students. And it's great when those other students say, you know, we feel the same and you've got that support. And when, when students support each other, then someone gets sick and someone, you know, catches up some of that work for you, you know, carries you when it's heavy. And, and, and that's great to see from our students. And it's, and it's part of the responsible leadership message that you're not, you're not in competition on, an, on a master's degree. You're in collaboration with them, with others. Christelle, I see people dropping off. So I think we're probably reaching a point of saturation. You can hand over to Samantha. She will be. Over to you, Sam. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Christelle. Thanks, Yaku. Um, then from our side, it's really time to say thank you. Um, it's now in Ghana, just after five. It's just after seven here in South Africa. Um, thank you so much to everyone who joined us. Uh, we hope that this was informative and we look forward to receiving either your inquiries for further information or actual applications. We are here. Yeah. We <laughs> want to welcome you at USB. Contact us um, and we will respond immediately. A very big thank you to um, Dr. Geraldine uh, Biden for hosting our alumni event, Professor Charles Ajasi for being our keynote speaker there tonight. Um, then also to uh, Yaku, oh, I must say Dr. Yaku Fulske, and to <laughs> Professor Newland. That's the, the most formal I got this evening. So thank you to both of them for the presentation here this evening. To Cristal, Lizalve and Ilza um, for all the arrangements. Um, to Vince for our IT. Um, and to everyone I'm missing that's in the background that helped to make this possible. Most importantly, though, to everyone who joined us this evening to find out more about USB and the programs we offer. So thank you very much. Take care and hope to see you at our open days. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs>